Sunday night was unbelievable. Um, Mike Kelly posted on Facebook. He said, God showed up at Forest Glory, and we had such a powerful altar service. He said it reminded me of going back to the days of Zion when he was in Zion Bible Institute. And to me, that's the time of revival. That's the time we had revival. And uh, I believe that why not? God could use nobodies to bring in and usher in a revival such as New England has not seen in years and years and years and years. And so <clears throat> I want to encourage you to come out Monday night. It's not the same. We're coming out with a fasting and we're coming out with prayer. We're fasting that one meal at night or an afternoon meal or a morning meal or the whole day, whatever you can do. And uh, we're coming on Monday night, and we had such a wonderful time. Tim Trafford was here. Pastor Mike Kelly was here. Uh, others are going to start coming. Uh, Pastor Manny's going to come. And so I've opened it up to every, everybody that wants to come to come and pray. We're not going to pray for needs necessarily. We're going to pray for the presence of God. We're going to pray to seek God in him only. Amen? So I'm excited about that. And, and uh, I just want to, I just was, as I was at the keyboard, I just felt if you need prayer tonight, if you need a healing in your body, come on forward. I'm going to pray with you. The Bible says to anoint with oil. My oil went somewhere. I don't know where it went. The other one. Where's the other one? Uh-huh. I hope somebody didn't steal that oil. Is it on, is it back here? Nope. I don't see it. Okay. The long skinny one? No, nope. let me see. I don't see it. Unless I'm going cuckoo here. See it. Nope. Praise the Lord. Anybody need healing in their body tonight? Come on. Joe, come on up for your ankle. You know, I want I'll tell you, nothing is too simple for God. Okay? Sometimes we think, oh well, well, you know. But God can heal. I'm telling you right now, I've seen God heal. I've seen him heal. Amen. So I'm just going to lay hands on you, just pray a quick prayer, and we'll move on the way that God wants us to move. Are we on Facebook yet, brother? God bless you. Facebook, I know it's a little strange, maybe because we're doing things out of, out of the ordinary, but we're going to pray for healing tonight. Uh, we had a powerful uh, move, as I said before, on Monday night, and God's still here. He hasn't left. Amen? And the reason why I know he's here because he's in us. Amen? And the Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, and and so I want to pray for those who might need a touch in their bodies tonight. The Bible says, if you have any be sick among you, call for the elders of the church, let them anoint them with oil, and the prayer of faith shall what? Save the sick. Amen? So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to believe God. And if, uh, if you can believe God, that's simple. Just believe God that he can do it, and he uses a vessel to do it. And we're just going to pray and believe God to touch you tonight. Amen? Praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just lay hands upon my sister. In Jesus' name, I bind every devil. I bind every spirit of infirmity. In the name of Jesus, I command all those spirits, Father, to leave her in the name of Jesus. I command sickness to leave her body and wholeness to enter in Jesus' name. And I thank you for it, God. I thank you and praise you for it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, I just pray for my brother's ankle. Word, which one, This one here, right? I just pray for his ankle, Father, in the name of Jesus. I anoint it, Father. I thank you, Father, that you're the great healer. You're the great provider. Lord, every tendon, every muscle, Father, every ache, every pain to go right now. In Jesus' name, I feel something moving in that thing right now. Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, let the swelling go down, Father. In Jesus' name, let there be a total healing for his ankle, Father. And when he, when he gets back to his seat, let it be totally healed, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for simplicity. Father, I just pray for my brother, Lord, who needs a healing touch from you, Lord, tonight. God, whatever that thing is uh, coming against him, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Father, for total healing from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. I give you praise and honor and glory tonight. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Father, and anoint my sister with oil. Father, thank you. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I come against that sciatic pain in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, I command that sciatic nerve to stop, that pressure to stop right now in Jesus' name. Total healing. Believe and you shall receive it. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for Vicki right now in the name of Jesus for total healing in her body from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Hallelujah. That little achiness, that little pain that's still there, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray, God, that that would go and that there'd be a speedily quick healing in every area of her body. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for it, God. Lord, I pray for my sister here. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, I come against every spirit that would try to attack her, mind, spirit, soul, and body. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, God, that you have your way. Father, I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, Lord, whatever she has need of and whatever reason she's standing here tonight, God, I pray that you manifest yourself and show yourself strong right now. Show yourself strong. Touch her, Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father. Huh? Oh, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for her arm, Lord. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for every tendon, every muscle, oh God. In the name of Jesus and her back, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that that back be healed in Jesus' name. That pain go wherever that initial uh, strike was. Father, I pray that it be gone. Every ache, every pain in Jesus' name. We thank you and we praise you for the healing power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Mm-mm. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Well, I got a pretty lengthy lesson tonight. And I don't think I'm going to get through it all. So I'm going to divert a little bit. Can I divert a little bit? Do I have that freedom to divert a little bit? I want to talk to you tonight about the heart of Christianity, if I can. The heart of Christianity. If you'll turn with me to Matthew 16, Matthew 16, verse 24. The next couple of weeks, uh, I don't know if you saw on Facebook, we have an advertisement for next week. Uh, Next Wednesday, we're going to have Brother um, Jim Moffat with us. He'll be with us on that Wednesday and the following Wednesday. I'll be here. I'm not going away. I'll be here. um, And um, he's going to be teaching on the covenants. So I think it's going to be a real blessing. If you haven't met Brother Moffat, I think, I don't know if Joe was here when he did uh, John and the Isle of Patmos. You know, we should have him do it here because we've got a nice platform now, you know, if he came and done it here. He does it in English and he does it in Chinese. It's amazing. If you go to YouTube and type in uh, John of Revelation, uh, Jim Moffat, he's got the whole thing right on YouTube. You can watch it. It's really, really cool. He does a great job. The heart of real Christianity, Matthew 16, 24. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you tonight, Father, that your word is quick and powerful. God, we're not here just to read some dead letters on a page. Lord, your word says it's quick, it's alive, it's powerful. And God, help us to receive that word in our spirit, God, so that we can have life, God. We, we go through the day, Lord, so many times not reading your word. We go through the day not looking at you first. We look at everything else. We look at the newspaper. We'll look at a, a book. We'll look at a, 
uh, uh, an article, we'll, we'll, we'll watch TV, whatever it might, might be. We do all of that first, and then we wonder why, God, there's delays in our life. So, God, you said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You said to do that first, seek the first kingdom of God, and all this other stuff will be added unto us. So, Father, help us tonight as we share your word tonight on the heart of real Christianity. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, I, how come that says that? Mine doesn't say that. Aha, uh -huh. okay, there we go. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him what? And what? And what? Okay, I'm going to read you the, the, uh, the socialized gospel version. Okay, the SGV. Okay. <laughs> then said Jesus to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him have everything he wants, lay down his cross, and follow me, and I'll make you rich and healthy and wise. That's today's gospel. That's what the gospel preachers on TV are preaching. You know, you can be rich. And, and I, don't, I never quite understood that when they said you can be rich when they're asking you for an offering. Yeah. Uh, you're so far in debt, and you go up to, for prayer for debt, and they say, uh, put your offering on your credit card. I don't understand that. There are four things that God says in this passage. Number one, he says, come after me. How do we come after God? I mean, Monday night we were after God, and I'm telling you, he showed up in a powerful way. How do we come after God? See, Psalm 108 verse 1 says this. Psalm 108 verse 1 says, says this. Oh God, my heart is what? It's fixed. My heart is fixed. In other words, it's, it's not because it was broken. It's one of those metaphors again. One of those symbolic things. It means it's steadfast. It's got its attention on God. My heart is fixed. I am determined. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Come after me. How does God want us to come after him? With a fixed heart. With a determined heart. To say, you know what, God? I'm coming after you. But we can't come on our terms. Hello? We can't come on our terms. We have to come on his terms. And if you come before him, what are the things that are required of you before you come? What does the Bible say in Hebrews? It says that we may come boldly, or we may come with confidence before the throne of grace to what? To obtain what? All right, stop right at the first word. To obtain grace. Why do you need grace? Because there's things in your life that you need to get forgiveness for. There's things in your life you need to get restored. There's things in your life that you need to confess before God. And I need to confess before God. And so we come to obtain grace... And mercy in time of need. We have access to God for the purpose of restoration. And we are to live and to walk in that restoration. The Bible says to walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says that sin will not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but you're under 
grace. So there's a protocol to coming into God's presence. You can't come to God's presence and then, you know, okay, I'm going before God and then go out and live like the world. Can't do it. You can't do it. And there are people that do it all the time. They, they, they go out and they, they're night clubbing on Saturday night and they're coming on Sunday morning raising their hands and praising the Lord. And they're out dancing and bumping and doing all kinds of stuff. And they think that's okay. I mean, one of the biggest churches in this area, there's a couple that goes to the church, they're not even saved. Not even saved. There's a, a, a girl that we know, okay, that goes to a big church, okay? And I asked her, I said, are you born again? She says, no, but I'm, I'm religious and I go to church and I'm a Christian. You can't be a Christian without being born again. But this is the kind of church that's rising up and coming up. And it's, it's, it's very pleasant to the flesh. It's very pleasant to the eyes. It, give, it brings gratification, and they have all the programs, and they have all of the things that your family needs, and they'll do everything for you except give you what you need. They'll give you what you want, but they'll never give you what you need. That takes a prophetic, anointed man of God to give you what you need and not fear whether you leave the church or whether you don't pay your tithes anymore. It takes somebody to stand up, to stand up here in the power of the Holy Ghost. And I said it before and I'll say it again. I want the power of the Holy Ghost. I don't want any other power. I don't want any other gimmicks. I don't have to bring camels and elephants up on the platform to entertain you. I don't have to put clowns up here to make you laugh. Oh, I want to give you the word of God. Hallelujah. The word of God that will stabilize your soul. The word of God will change your very thinking. It will change your very direction. It will change. Hallelujah. You're very hot. Come after me. Come after me. It's like, you know, when, when you find and you meet a girl. I'll talk to the guys now, okay, guys? When you met your girlfriend or you met your wife, Nelson, when you met, first met your wife, the first time you saw her, first time you met her, I don't know if you fought or not, but I'm, I don't know, we'll go there, but... But the first time you saw her, and then you started to pursue her, and then you started to take her out to dinner and, and, and go places and do things, you wanted to pursue, you wanted to go after her. You wanted to develop a relationship with her. And that's what come after me is. There's a strong desire. You want to be with that person. You want, you want to spend your life with that person. That's what you want to do is you want to come after the Lord. And he, he's, he wants to, he want, and I'll tell you, I used to have a friend. Linda and I had a friend in, in Bible school. And every Friday night, okay, every Friday night, right after dinner, he'd go to his room. He'd spend an hour in his room. He'd take a shower. He'd get dressed up. And every Friday night, he'd go to the chapel all by himself. And he sit there and he have a date with the Lord. And he told me, he said, Bob, I've been doing that for years. And he says, every time the Lord showed up, the Lord never stood him up. He said, I went there, people thought I was crazy. He said, but I had the most intimate fellowship times with the Lord than I've ever had before. Now, you don't have to get dressed up and go see the Lord. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying to you is the desire the desire should be there. Not, oh God, it's Monday, I gotta go to church. Oh God, it's Wednesday, I gotta go to church. Oh God, it's Sunday, I gotta go to church. No, you don't go to church because you have to. You go to church because you want to. I remember uh, Joe was telling me one time when his friends came over for a weekend and uh, they are kind of trying to get him to stay home from church on Sunday. And he was like, no, 
He says, no, you don't understand. I don't have to go. I want to go. I need to go. That's where I need to be. And that's the way it should be. We come after the Lord. He says, come after me. If any man will come after me, desire me, long for me, search for me. He says, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For he that knock, it shall be opened. And he that seeks shall find. That's the promise. To, can I tell you, we need God's presence. I'll tell you, I've been enjoying, since Monday, I've been enjoying his presence. I got up this morning, and I, and I, I don't know what song was I singing. Oh, that song of, of, about the, how uh, Brother Tim was telling us uh, Monday night, you know. Uh, I can't get it in my mind right now because I'm preaching in my mind right now. But it was, you know, uh, well, how did it go, Phil? Breathe on me, breathe on, breathe on me. Let him breathe on me. Let the breath of God now breathe on me. Let him breathe on me. Let him breathe on me. Let the breath of God now breathe in me. Wow. Wow. Breathe on me, God. And so this morning I get up, I'm, I'm you know, I stayed home most of the, I stayed all home, I stayed home all day, I didn't go out at all. And, and this morning I get up, right, and I went into the bathroom, I get into the shower, and what happened? Breathe on me. I start to weep. Breathe. Jesus, just breathe on me. I need you, Lord. That's what we need, and that's what's going to bring revival. Can I tell you, revival doesn't start in the city. Revival doesn't start in the church. Revival starts in you and me. That's where revival starts. If we can catch that, you know, we always say, well, waiting on God for revival. No, God's waiting on us. Because the moment we begin to put everything and anything aside for God and put him as our main objective, revival will come. You can have prayer meetings for years, nothing happens. But if you listen to God, and I believe, I believe this, it all started Sunday morning. I'm driving my car here, had my little sermon all set. I get at the stoplight, Allen Street and County Street, and the wind kicks up in this tree, and, and the leaves are going like this. And it went like, and what I'm doing with my hand, it didn't stop. I mean, it was going like this for quite a while at that red light. It was like that red light was the longest red light I stayed at. Okay? And it was going like that. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to put your message aside and I want you to preach my message. I said, What's that, Lord? And as soon as I looked at the tree, I knew the rustling of the mulberry tree. Come on, somebody. And you know what happened Sunday. Wow. Wow. And then you know what happened Monday. See, if we will only obey and stop fighting God, stop, resist, stop resisting God, stop trying to get in God's way by saying, no, I will not, no, I choose not, but just say, God, have me. I mean, even to the point, and I'm going to say this, okay, even to the point Monday night, Bob Lewis had tears in his eyes. See, he's all sophisticated, you know, sat there with glasses like he was just kind of cleaning his eyes, you know. But I know what was happening. God was touching that man. God was doing something in him. And always remember, God always does things for eternity purposes. But it's up to us to cultivate that, to, to get that going, to keep it going. So the first thing he says is, come after me. Second thing he says is to deny yourself. Deny yourself. What does that mean? It means to completely disown, to utterly separate
from someone. You ever have somebody, a relationship, or have somebody in your life, and they all they did was drag you down, tear you down, speak negative, speak negative, speak negative, just drain all the very life of God out of you. I mean, you spend hours and hours and talking with them and trying to help them and, and doing all kinds of things, and you give them whatever they need, and, and they come back the next day, and they need more, and they're very needy, 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 needy. But then you tell them about God, oh, I don't, I don't want that. You have to separate yourself from someone like that. Come on, somebody. You've had friends like that that just kept tearing you down, tearing down, tearing down, tearing down your faith, tearing down. You don't need friends like that. You're your friend. That's a, that's a tool of the devil in, in, in the devil's hand to rob you of your faith. He says, deny himself. We're called to lay something down. The disciples are, are commanded to disown themselves, to refuse to acknowledge the self of the old man. Do you know you have an old man, and you have a new man? Amen. You have an old man, the old nature, and you have a new nature, because God says you are partakers of the divine nature. It's living inside of you. Who you yield to, every day, who you yield to, is what is producing fruit in your life. If you Yield to the old man and the old ways of doing the same things in the old paths that you used to walk in. You're going to get the fruit of that. You plant an apple seed, right? What do you get? Bananas? No, you get what you sow, right? The Bible says, so whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So don't think for a moment that you can continue to sow and sow and sow in the flesh and you're going to reap spirit. It ain't going to happen. The only way you'll reap of the spirit is if you sow to the spirit. The only way you'll grow in Christ and this word will become alive to you and this word won't be just a bunch of uh, letters on a page, but it'll be God's word speaking to your heart and bringing, oh, Rabbi Shaka, bringing life. To you is when you sow life, you reap life. The Bible says the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. There are deep things of God. But it comes through denying yourself. When you deny yourself, then God can move. God can begin to do things. You know, sometimes when we're so filled with self, we try to help God get things done. God says, no, just, just obey my voice. My sheep know my voice. It's so simple. It really is. Jesus was here today, and he was walking down this aisle, and he said, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Come follow me. Come follow me. I want you to know something. No one got up. I know I'm not Jesus, but guess what? <laughs> Suppose Jesus was trying to tell you something through me. Huh? Huh? Come on. Come on. I did that as an object lesson. But I don't think you were thinking, well, he's not Jesus. Were you? No, you weren't thinking that. 
Hallelujah. Let me turn this You got to deny yourself. You know how many times I've seen people walk by a piece of paper on the floor? Come on. The Bible says if you see to do good and you don't do it, what? Oh, you know somebody has a need and you just walk by. How's the love of God dwell inside of you? You know what I love about God and God's love? And I guess God was working on me, Job, even before I was saved. You know, like Jeremiah said, from my mother's womb. I've never had a prejudiced bone in my body. I mean, Joe and I, we grew up together, and I lived in the West End. And I've known him for 47 years. Yeah, in troubling times, remember the riots and all that stuff? My family was one of the only few white people that lived in that area. And I'm going to tell you something. Because I lived there, nobody burned my house down. Nobody took my father's car over. Nobody sprayed paint all over the house. Nothing. You know why? Because they knew me and they knew my family. And they knew that we, we, were, we, treated, we would treat them with respect and they treated us with respect. And we loved them and they loved us. Come on, somebody. That was even before I was a Christian. And I could walk down that street. Come on now. I could walk down that street five days after Lester Lima was killed by four white men from a Kushner. And I could walk there, and, and Joe and I would stand right there on the corner, right near Parashini's Variety. And we'd stand right there on the corner, and no one took out a gun and shot and killed me. Or said anything or looked at me differently or down my race, didn't, didn't say nothing. That's why I can travel to Nigeria. That's why I can travel to India. That's why I can travel to all these places that God opens up the door, China, and all over the place, because I love people. Hello. Now, Joe and I didn't always agree, man. We had some head button, you know, and stuff like that going on. You know, we always did that, right? But, I mean, you know, I always... Respected Joe's intelligence, so even though I didn't let him know it. <laughs> you <laughs> you got to deny yourself and disown yourself. This is the heart of real Christianity. We're to count the old man as dead. Do you, now, do you do these principles I'm telling you? You apply these principles to your life every day. When you wake up and the devil comes over and he wants to, you know, you, you know your husband starts on you, okay, and he starts, nin, 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 and in the flesh you want to just tell him something? Come on. Yeah, you're all laughing because you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, first thing, your eye ain't even open yet, and they're already humming on you. Or it can be vice versa. It can be the wife. And you want to tell him something, and it's almost coming out of your lips. And a voice inside you says, don't say it. I'll never forget this time happened in my life. My wife and I were, were in bed, you know, and uh, she was aggravating me. Yeah, you, I, oh, yeah, yeah, you all look at her little face, and, you know, she's shining like like gold, you know, and she looks all wonderful and everything. Uh, she wasn't always like that, you know. And sometimes she still ain't like that. Okay? But she kept playing. I was tired. I wanted to go to sleep. She, get, she kept kicking me, you know, under the couch. She kept kicking me, you know. I told her, I said, knock it off. And, you know, you know, she gets that little brat look. If you know, if you know Linda, there's that little brat look she has. And she had that little brat look on her face. She kept kicking me and kicking me. And I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, I'm laying in bed saying, Lord, I want to go to sleep, and this woman's kicking me. I'm going to say something. And he, you know what he told me? He says, don't, don't you say anything. Let me say it through you. And she went to kick me again. And I can feel, you know how you can feel it's coming? 
And this came out of my mouth. Really, truly. She'll testify this is the truth, right? If you've done it to the least of these, you have done it as unto me. And she stopped her kick right in the middle. What happened? Conviction. Conviction. Hello? Conviction. I had to put down the old man that could have said, left turn, Clyde. If you saw the movie, you know what I'm talking about. But no, I put that down, and I let God's word speak. And it was amazing, because right I could feel it was right in the middle of the kick. And she stopped. Another time, <laughs> we were arguing about something. And she brings up the past, you know? Sometimes when you ladies have a tendency to do that sometimes, you know? For the mistakes we've made, you go back, you open up the file cabinet, blah, 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 and I spoke to her again, and I said, how would you like it if God opened your file cabinet of your past? And she closed that file cabinet spiritually and never opened it again. See, that's what God wants us to do, is to deny ourselves. Deny ourselves. The heart of real Christianity is coming after God, having a fixed heart, denying self, and then take up your cross. Now, in today's society, you see a guy that has a big cross walking across the country. Everybody's clapping. Yay! <laughs> That's not what it means. Some of you may even have a gold cross around your neck. Nothing wrong with it. But you know what that gold cross represents? It's an execution stake. In Roman days, that's how they executed people. It would be like today hanging an electric chair around your neck. Think about it. It's exactly the same thing. It's taking your life. It's something that was used to execute a human being. And what God is saying for you to take up your cross is he's, he's telling you, execute the old man. Keep bringing him to death. You just have to remember, the old man is on the death, death row. He was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, Paul says, but yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the only way Christ will live in you and the only way Christ will live in me is if we're willing to take up our cross. Your cross is not your, is not your husband. Your cross is not your father. Your cross is not your mom. Your cross is not your sister or your brother. It's not your, your husband or your wife. It's not even your children. That's not your cross to bear. And he says, take up your cross. He means take up and execute self. Your selfish ways, your selfish thinking, execute it. Get rid of it. When you deny yourself, you also make no provision. Romans 13, 14. Romans 13, 14. I don't think I'm even going to get through some of this. Yeah. Romans 13, 14. He says, but put ye on... The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, stop for a moment. Are the Romans Christians saved? Whether they're Jew or Gentile, are they saved? Huh? I'm, I'm seeing blank stares. Are they saved? Come on, you had the book of Romans to study. I gave you a certificate and everything. Right, are they Christian? Are they saved? Are they Christians? Is, is the Apostle Paul writing to the Romans? Yes, so they're Christians. But yet he's telling them to put on Jesus Christ. So it's not, 
put on Jesus Christ to be saved. It's put on Jesus Christ to not make any provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lust of it. Everybody thinks lust is sex. It's not only that. Okay, The lust of the eyes. Watch it when you go shopping, ladies. The devil says, who are you going to have that? So-and-so's got one. You can have one, too. Do you take God shopping with you? Does anybody take God shopping with them? Raise your hand if you take God shopping with you. One, per, two, per, two people. I take God shopping with me all the time. It saves me tons of money. Come on. He really, really does. Sister Lucy, you know what I'm talking about, right? He's a better deal maker than Donald Trump. He'll give you a deal. I went out to lunch with Deputy Chief and uh, um, Pastor Amaral yesterday, and we're, we're at this uh, buffet restaurant, you know, Portuguese restaurant in uh, East Providence. And um, we're there, and all of a sudden, this guy walks into the bar. You know, he's not even a Christian. He's not even saved. And he goes, hey, is that you, John Amaral? And, you know, Pastor Amaral, hey, how you doing? He goes over, gives him a hug, and everything talks to him, you know, and, you know, just how you doing and everything. He says, he says, I want to buy you a drink. And Pastor says, I haven't drank in years. He said, well, what are you drinking, coffee? You want a coffee? He said, yeah, coffee. And then he did this. He said, when the bill came, he said to the waitress, give me Pastor John's Emerald's bill and the other two guys with him. A sinner. Not even saved, but because of the reputation of Pastor John with that man. And he told Pastor John, he said, Pastor John, he said, will you come and pray for, for my business? Will you come and pray for me? Another open door. When do you hear people saying, will you come and pray for me? That's a sinner. God's favor. And because God was blessing him, because we were there, we got blessed too. Can I tell you, when you're with Jesus... You're an heir. Come on. And you put Jesus first, you're going to be blessed. I'm not going to say you're going to get everything you want. No, you won't. But you get everything you need. To deny oneself means to follow the example set forth by the Lord Jesus himself in coming to this world. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. Now, you're getting a good message tonight, so don't skip church on Sunday. Deny yourself. (laughs) Let this mind, what is your mind? What does your mind do? Makes decisions. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this attitude, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Next verse. But made himself of no reputation. See, the Pharisees, They would never talk to a Samaritan woman by the well, alone. The Samaritan was a half-breed, half-Jewish, half-Gentile. Wouldn't have anything to do with the Samaritans. Even the Bible, Jesus even talked about that. He said, why are you being a Samaritan woman? Speak to me, a Jew. You have nothing to do with us. But Jesus made of himself no reputation. He didn't think he was better than anybody else. He was God, though. But his attitude was to serve. 
And he says, and he took upon him the form of a king, of a monarch, a VIP. No, he took on the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men. Next verse. And being found in fashion as a man, he, what? He humbled himself. The heart of real Christianity is humility, not pride. He humbled himself and became obedient. Notice that word became. He became obedient. That means that every step of the way, God will put something in your, in your way, okay? A, an opportunity for you to be obedient. And the devil will throw something in your way to be disobedient. Like I said, I've been at this for over almost 40 years. Pretty close. Yeah, I would say, yeah, 62. One more year will be 40 years. And that's the year of testing and probation. I hope not. <laughs> Praise God. But anyway, he became obedient. This happens all the time. Parents, they want to get their kids involved in sports. They get their kids involved in sports. And what day is the game on? Sunday. Practice on Wednesday, okay? And all of a sudden now, you can't come to church anymore on Sunday. The devil throws those things in people's laps just to see what you're going to choose. It's sad to say, many people fail that. Because they make church an option rather than a necessity. Church is a necessity to hear God's word so that his word, you hide it in your heart that you what? And that you grow in grace and in the knowledge of his will. How are you going to know God's will for your life? How are you going to know how God provides for you if all the time you're sitting there with unanswered prayer in your life? Come on. He says, this is the way. Walk ye in it. No. I'm going to go this way. Our wisdom, our intellect, our thinking supersedes what God says. And we go down this road, and guess what? We get in trouble. But God said, walk in this way. Walk this way. Go this way. We have to humble ourselves and say, God, I'm going to do it your way, not my way. Frank Sinatra sang that song. I did it my way. Yeah, and you're in hell right now. If you ain't born again, you don't go to heaven. I don't care what these false prophets and false teachers and false apostles and pastors out there are telling people that they can stay the same way and live the same way and they're going to go to heaven. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Come on, somebody. My Bible says narrow is the way and few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many go in thereat. That's the words of Jesus, not me. So don't throw the tomatoes at me. How much time I got? Five more minutes. We're to take up the cross. And we are called to live something out. We're to follow him. Go back to my main scripture now. He became obedient unto death, even death of the cross. In other words, he was not going to take the easy way out. 
The easy way out would when you know didn't he say Jesus say if I wanted to I could call my father he'll send a legion of angels to come down here and kill all of you. I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of kind of what he said. But he became obedient even to the death upon a cross. He didn't take the easy way out. And neither if we're followers of him. Come on now. I hope you get this. If you're a follower of him, don't take the easy way out. The easy way out is not to crucify the flesh. The easy way out is just to kind of sail along. The easy way out is not to listen to God and go in the paths that he chooses. The easy way out is to sit there in church and think that because you go to church and because you, you come in your fellowship with Christians, that you're a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian. Just like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Come on, somebody. We're called to follow him. It must have been tough being Jesus' brother. Think about it. James, Jesus' brother, growing up as little kids. I can hear Mary now saying, James, why can't you be more like Jesus? <laughs> Come on. I have a what would Jesus do bracelet. How come we don't have what would James do? <laughs> but to follow him. But you're not going to know how to follow him. And it's, like, it's like, see, us men are great at this. Okay? Before GPS and all that stuff, right? And we get lost, and our wife would say, stop for directions. And what do we say? I'm not lost. I'll get us there, Right? Well, see, Nelson obeys you because you, you really bring the hammer down. You say, you better stop, Nelson, wasting our time. <laughs> what? Oh, you stop when he stops? You get annoyed when he stops so many times? Oh, so you're the one that doesn't stop, and he's the one that does stop. There's a, uh, what they call a repulsive magne magnetism that twists the other way. You know, when you put two magnets together, and they go, whoop. Okay. Then I himself and follow him. But you won't know how to follow him if you don't know him. How are you going to know him? How did you learn physics? We have a books, but you had teachers. Okay. And you had to no, it has to go in here first. You had to listen, right? You had to absorb the instruction. Then you had to read it. And then you had to do it, the examples. And then you got what's called a test. And the test wasn't there to show how much you knew. It was there to show you how much you didn't. Hello? Tests aren't bad. They just, they just show you what you don't know and what you need to brush up on. Unless you're like Joe and get A's all the time in hundreds. I'm sure you got a few B's in there. See, then my friend is the Harvard man. He went to Harvard. Amen. But to follow him, Lord, what would you do in this situation? Do you do that? When you're facing a situation? Do you, no, you know what? Most people come to me and say, Pastor, would you pray with me about such and such a situation? Sure. And we pray. And God would speak to me and say, I don't think you should do that. Oh, oh, oh. Guess what? They go and do what they want anyway. Then, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, 
There we go. Theatrics, I love it. <laughs> that was great timing, you know. It's like theatrics. We need that. We need to do that, you know. But following him, how are we going to know? And, and, and people would come and say, pray for me. But their minds are already made up. To make that decision, it's like, you can't do that with God. You can't go to God and say, oh God, you know, I'm looking for direction, I'm looking for direction, and all the time you already have it in your heart, you're going to do what you want to do. You sow to the flesh, you reap to the flesh. Corruption. You sow to the Spirit. I'm trying to teach you tonight. We need to sow to the Spirit. That's why Monday nights we're coming here. We're going to fast as many meals as you can that day. And I don't expect people that are working to fast all day. I know you can't. You need your strength. Okay. So fast a meal or fast your television. Don't turn the television on for the whole day. Some of you will go through withdrawal. <laughs> oh, I'm having a Fox moment. <sighs> CNN, oh. no Facebook. Ah, that's a big one. No Facebook for a day. No, no, no. Come on, half of you people know what's the truth because if you, don't, if you forget your phone at home, most of you will go home and back and get it. If most of you forget your Bible at home, you still come to church anyway. <laughs> come on, you know I'm speaking the truth here. <laughs> but then somebody will say, yeah, but pals, I got the Bible on my phone. <laughs> Follow me, he said. Follow me. He was gentle, he was kind, but he was tough when he needed to be. He didn't call those people white walled sepulchers and vipers and snakes for nothing. Come on, somebody. Oh yeah, he's a gentle, he's a gentle person, he's a loving, kind Jesus, he is, he, he's all those things, he's compassionate, but don't push his button. Come on, somebody, those, those Pharisees were pushing his button, man. He said, you white wall sepulchers, you. You're full of dead men's bones. You pretend on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones, you hypocrites, vipers, snakes. I don't think he, I don't think he, he approached anybody like this. You viper, <laughs> snake, white wall sepulcher. No, he was a man. Snake. Viper. Hypocrite. Come on, somebody. Follow Jesus. Now, don't go in people's faces and call them. <laughs> Say, I'm following Jesus, you hypocrite. <laughs> no, you have to use. You have to use what? Wisdom, kindness, gentleness. Be a follower. Well, like I was going to say before, see, when you come back up here, my mind clicks back where I was. Men don't like directions. But before GPSs, before AAA with trip ticks and all that stuff, right? The only way that you would find your way around is if you had a map. And you would sit down beforehand, if you were smart enough, not while you're driving. <laughs> and you'd figure out the route you needed to take. And then you write them down. And you never hand them to your wife. You keep them hung up right there so you can see them. Because you're asking, yeah, take this right here. Oh, that's not the right. Oh, I thought it was. <laughs> I 
I think that happened to us, didn't it? But anyway, the only way you're going to follow Jesus is if you follow the map. Learn about his life. Learn how he was submissive to the Father. He says, all the things that the Father wants, I do. He said, whatever the Father speaks, is that what I speak? That should be part of learning to follow Jesus. When you go to do something and you have that check in your spirit and God says, don't do that, don't go there. Hello? You know, there was a lot of backslidden Christians in that, that nightclub fire in, in, in Warwick that time when that nightclub burnt down and people died in that nightclub. I think 100-something people died in that nightclub. There were backslidden Christians in there. Now, hopefully they had time to crawl, cry out to God and, and get their hearts right before they died. But the penalty was they died. Hello? Don't be where you don't need to be. Follow Jesus. Because it will be worth it all. But I'm telling you, time is short. Things are going to get worse. Look at the two volcanoes now. Two of them, one in Hawaii, one in Guatemala. Okay? Something's happening in the earth. You know what the Bible says? All of creation groans for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's groaning. There's going to be earthquakes. I just counted 23 earthquakes the other day. because I, I have that on my phone, I, I, on my radar. I can show you that you can have it so that you can see all the earthquakes all over the world. 23 earthquakes in one day. Jesus said in the last days, earthquakes will increase. Pestilence. Revelation says, and by their sorceries, all the, all the nations of the earth will be deceived. That word sorceries is the Greek word pharmasukos, where we get the word pharmacy, where we get the word drugs. You can't turn the TV on with every other commercial say, take this drug, take that drug. You got this, you got bipolar, second polar, third polar. You got all kinds of North Pole, South Pole. You, I mean, you got all kinds of stuff today. If I took a pill for everything that, every ache and pain that I had, I'd be on 30, 30 pills a day. Buy their drugs till all the nations of the earth be deceived. Because you know what? Drugs ain't your answer. What are you going to do? What are you going to do if the Monetary system becomes a chip in your hand or forehead before the Antichrist. If they start to implement that and say, oh, you need medication? Guess what? You can't get your medication unless you get the chip. What are you going to do? Don't tell me God understands. No. The Bible says if you take that mark, guess what? It's all over. Or your SSI check or your disability check. You don't get it unless you take that mark. What are you going to do? You better start depending on God now and learning how to depend on him. Hallelujah. Because God can take a raven and feed you. God did it to me the other day. It was a cinnamon raven. Came and paid for my lunch. Praise God. Follow him. True Christianity, the real heart of Christianity, is number one, come after me. Two is to deny yourself. Three is to take up your cross. And four is to follow him. 100%, not 90%, not 75%, not 60%, not 50%, 100%. Do I have a 100% vote on that? Amen. Let's all stand. Yep. Oh, Pastor Tom is traveling sadly. Now see, he didn't come to me and ask me for prayer. He didn't say, Pastor, I'm going to Texas to pick up my granddaughter. Would you like to come with me? <laughs> you know, I, I, I kind of feel bad about that, you know? <laughs>